coming up on Theater Talk. The great thing about Broadway and Broadway shows and what we do, it's, a, it's, it's the other great art form other than jazz that we invented. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. theater fan knows that song. That is the great opening number to Grand Hotel. Welcome to Theater Talk. I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. And I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskins. And if you were with us last week, you know we have been having a great time at the piano with the composer lyricist Maury Yeston, who in addition to Grand Hotel wrote Nine, Titanic, and Phantom, and he's agreed to stick around for this week to tell us more stories about his life in the theater. I'd be happy to. to. <laughs> um, you know, I started with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Grand Hotel is a show I absolutely loved. A couple things about that show, um, sort of just instructive things about how you write a musical. An opening number, absolutely essential, right, to set the tone? It, it's, it's the absolutely essential thing, and, and the, the thing that's least known about writing opening numbers, and I should say that the great thing about Broadway and Broadway shows and what we do, it's, a con it's, it's the other great art form other than jazz that we invented, and it's the same idea. It does involve a certain amount of improvisation, and, and you end up writing the opening last. You do have an opening. You write the opening last because you cannot know the exact way to open the show until you have that to which you need to open. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Once yeah. you have a sense of the show, and in the case of Grand Hotel, what is it? How do, and we need to know in the first five minutes. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody has to, for example, put a, a hand over somebody's tie and say, I'll bet you $1,000 you can't tell me the color of the tie you're wearing, and that's not a bet. And then somebody says, well, I'll bet you $1,000 I could take any girl you point to to Havana, and he says, that one, and she's banging the drum for the Salvation Army, and it's guys and dolls. <laughs> Five minutes. Yeah. Five minutes, a girl in Covent Garden talks, and somebody says, I can teach, you know, I could pass her off as a duchess if I can just teach her how to talk properly. And in this case, this is a unique, difficult story, because it, the novel written by Vicki Baum in 1928, which then became a play and then a, a movie in 1934 with the famous Greta Garbo, mm -hmm. was the first story in which there were five completely separate stories that were related only by the fact that they were happening in the same place. Later, we got the towering inferno and airplane and everything else. Yeah, but right, this was right. radical. So how do you start a story like that? You're in Berlin. You're in the Grand Hotel. It's Weimar, Germany. Uh, and you have a lot of different people. And, and what, what's the show about? Why should I care about this? What's intriguing to me uh, about this? Well, they, I, I, I was obviously very close and very friendly with Toon. We had done nine together. And Tommy Toon, who Tommy directed Toon, Grand Hotel. And he yeah. brought the show. The show had been written by two legends of the theater, right and far. It's really magnificent writers. I mean, these people. Kismet. And oh, yes. They were just quite, quite wonderful. And they had written the show in the 50s and sort of brought it back to life uh, in, 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 in 1989. And off they went to Boston. And I, I got a phone call from Toon. And it was one of those, I mean, it was just like living in a black and white movie. He said, Yeston, this is Toon. Uh, I, I've got a room for you at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel uh, with a piano. Come save the show. Oh. <laughs> and so off I went to Boston. And I had lunch with Wright and Forrest, which was an honor. Right. And I, I, I saw the show, which really did not have an opening number. And in fact, there weren't even any applause moments at the end of songs. They, they had, Toon had decided to, to make it music all the time and not even stop for applause. And, and I said, look, gentlemen, um, I'm here to give you the best advice I can, and my, uh, my advice is to understand that you and the director are not in the same place. I mean, he, you want to go to Chicago, and he's flying the plane to Detroit. Mm. And so you need to either get a new director, or you need to adapt your piece to Tommy's vision, which I think is a very good one. It's very choreographic, and it's almost seamless. And they were adorable. I, there, there are no, there's no other word. They would say, you know, no, dear boy, you know, we would never do anything to put actors out of work, of course. And uh, I said, well, you know, you've got about three weeks to get it right. You have a great deal of rewriting. 
to, to do. And then it, Wright, who said, well, you know, Johnny Mercer used to say two couplets a week. Two couplets <laughs> a week. And I said, at the rate of two couplets a week, it, it'll be 10 years before you can fix this show. <laughs> you work with pieces of what you have. There's really no time. I mean, I, wrote the, I, I got there in the afternoon. I wrote the opening that night. It was in the show the next night. So this is old-fashioned. I'm in the hotel room having Absolutely. to... Absolutely. You know, I mean, you have to... There we are at the Ritz-Carlton. The Ritz-Carlton has the most beautiful... Uh, uh, carpeting everywhere, or, or on the little staircases, and, and the most beautiful crystal chandeliers. And uh, we always like to talk about in the old Ritz-Carlton, there was a, a perfume that they had in the elevator. Everybody used to talk about it. Whatever that smell is in the Ritz-Carlton elevator. And, uh, and honestly, you know, I walked through and went up the piano in the room, and it became velvet stairs. Oh, there are easy chairs, too, in the <laughs> velvet stairs. Easy chairs, perfume there gently blowing, chandeliers, light appears, burning bright, crystal glowing, people come, people go, wave of life overflowing, come begin in all. You're in the Grand Hotel. And there we were. We were in the Grand Hotel. I, you know, for better or for worse, that's what the show's about, and that's where we are. And, and all inspired by walking through into the Ritz-Carlton. That's where we were. But that's but musicals are solving a series of problems. There's no question. They are absolutely solving a series. And the great thing about them is, is that it gives you an opportunity to have a problem you could never think of. Yeah. I mean, imagine Stephen Sondheim having a problem that a man has to sing a song to his razors. <laughs> 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 which become the instruments of his vengeance, and he writes, uh, you know, a, a lyric of genius, my friends. Hmm. Uh, they're his friends. And, and, so, and Grand Hotel was a, a series of great challenges like that. Probably the greatest challenge of all was that David Carroll, who plays the, uh, the Baron, mm -hmm. um, is in the, the, uh, the room of a businessman in the second act, and he's stealing his wallet. He needs the money, and the businessman surprises him and shoots him through the heart. And Toon said, well, you've got to write him a song. <laughs> and I said, he, 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 he's dead. <laughs> and he said, yeah, right, but you know, he's the star of the show. He's got to have a song. <laughs> and I, I, he's dead. He said, I know, but he's got to. So, I mean, the, you can't make this stuff up. So I, walk, I walk, it was the Colonial <laughs> Theater in Boston. I walked around the corner, and I, I, w I was literally feeling suicidal. I mean, this is, how, this is how the shows get fixed. And I remember Ed Kleban, who was my dear friend and the funniest man in the world. I remember he had once told me that he tried to commit suicide by eating a, eating a seeded roll very quickly and choking on it. Uh, well, he didn't want to hang himself. I mean, that could be. And so I, th and I passed a Chinese restaurant, and I thought, okay, I'll buy an egg roll. Maybe I'll choke on that and die, and I won't have to write this song. And I, 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 honestly, I walked in, I ordered an egg roll, and I sat there, and I thought, wait a minute. When you die, isn't your life supposed to pass by in an instant before your eyes? What about we shoot him in the heart, and he runs forward, and he's wearing his, he's dressed in a beautiful tuxedo, and he starts singing about, you know what? I made it to the station. I've got the roses. I'm going to go off with the ballerina, and my whole life has led to this point. God, I remember when I was a soldier. I remember when I was a kid. And I opened up Vicki Baum's book and found out all kinds of biographical information about the Baron. And I thought, oh, and what if as he's singing this, his white shirt turns red? Mm. So the truth is, is that when people say what comes first, the music or the lyrics, it's the, the truth, it's the premise, it's the whole thing together. And I went back and I told this to Tune, and he said, great, let's do it. And they rigged David Car started writing it, and they rigged David Carroll with a little pump mm -hmm. in, his, in, in his pocket. And as he sang the song, his shirt turned red. And, and the way the number worked, you, you hear the shot. He runs forward. He does the number. At the end of the number, we hear the echo of the shot, and we go to blackout. And the whole song happens in an instant in, in the echo of, of, of the shot that killed him. It was just stunning. Yeah. And, and Grand Hotel was a series of problems like that. The huge one was for Flemshen. And this was the really great debut of, of Jane Krakowski. Yes, and she yes. was fantastic. You in made it. her career in and, Grand and, Hotel. And she was wonderful. And she had to, she was looking into the mirror in, in, in the ladies' room and, and saying, you know, what, what, what do I want? Because at the time, to be a movie star was everything. And the problem thus far was we didn't know we were in Weimar, Germany. And, uh, and I remembered, well, I can write her a song that goes like this. I want to be that girl in the mirror there. I want to be that girl with golden hair up on a silver screen most everywhere in the world. I want to go to Hollywood talkies. I mean the pictures. I want. So there was that song. And then I thought, oh, I did something really interesting in nine. There was a song called My Husband. 
makes movies. In the middle of the song, when Louisa Cantini is talking to the reporters, she goes into her mind and remembers 20 years ago. Guido Cantini, Louisa Cantini, actress with dreams and a life of her own. And then comes out of that, and she's back in the present. And I thought, well, why can't I do that for Flemshin? Why can't I have her say, I want to go to Hollywood so I can get far away from Friedrichstrasse, my cold water flat, the noisy neighbor in the next room, my broken coffee pot, everything about the dreary, awful experience she's having in Friedrichstrasse, where you live with little soap and with hardly any hope. suddenly there's this despair and the reason that she wants to go to Hollywood. Uh, the only way to make those kinds of discoveries is, is to be in, is to be in, in the trouble. thick of it, trying to... Is to is, uh, yes, yeah. and to be in the thick of it, and I think that's where the creativity comes from. Again, when you are plowing new territory that, where, you, where you, even you don't know quite where to go, that's how you know that you'll be ahead of the audience. Yes, And exactly. that's how you know that they'll be following you, you won't be giving them information, and you're in that wonderful, magical moment of musical theater where everything that you hear comes to you as a great surprise, and the minute you hear it, it seems like it cannot have been otherwise. Yeah. Will you play me a song you wrote for Michael Jeter in Grand Hotel that I think <laughs> is one of your, has one of your most I, I might not remember all of it, but that's all right, I'll but it has one you. of your most beautiful melodies. He's I a think. dying man, yeah. and he's, come, he's, he's left the sanitarium, and he, he walks in. From the hospital to the town of Berlin, I have taken a train here to begin my new life, though quite soon that must end. But until that occurs, I do intend to remain. I want to know that I once was here, while all my faculties still are clear, and check into my room. As I planned at the Grand Hotel, and I wrote a cough into it. <laughs> <Grand> <laughs> Hotel. And Jeter was just so yeah, magnificent. Fabulous. That's why he won the he won the Tony. Yeah. Working on Grand Hotel, you worked with, as we mentioned before, the great Peter Stone, one yes. of the great librettists, and one of the funniest men. Oh golly, he was funny in the world. Yeah. Just give us a little sense of how funny was Peter. How Peter, funny was Peter? Peter coined the term. Peter co coined the term. Somebody told me not to repeat this, so I'll only say it once. <laughs> uh, it, it, was, it was Peter who taught me, really, that in the theater it's legislation by temper tantrum. <laughs> Just scream. And, and Peter, no matter, no matter what any director would say, any cut, even if he was asking for so much as a syllable of a cut, Peter always had the same answer, which was, but that's the only reason I wrote the show. <laughs> that's the only reason I wanted to write the show. He was really, really very funny. And, but, uh, but he had learned from the greats how to fix the show, and, and I learned from him. Mm -hmm. and, and interestingly enough, when, when we did Titanic, obviously we crashed into every conceivable iceberg you could, <laughs> not to mention the fact, I mean, look, even the title of the show, it was a musical disaster to begin with. I think I remember writing a Daily News story announcing you guys were doing Titanic. Watch him, all sing, watch, him, watch, all him sing, watch him sing, watch him dance, watch him drown. That's right. But you see, Peter's <laughs> theory was is that you really do want to lower expectations. You don't want to come in, everybody go, gee, I hear it's a big hit, and then the audience walks in and says, show me. It's yeah. much better to say, I hear they're having some problems, and then, oh, they're working on them. Oh, I hear it's getting better. And pretty soon, if you, if you do your job right, we had seen that happen with my one and only. Yes. It had happened with, with, with the Grand Hotel. And so when, when Titanic was really, we were really just mired in a, in a, in a set that was not working. We had, it was a, it was a massive. I went to the first preview, around yeah. about almost four hours yeah I, think. I, I watched I, I saw two different husbands say to two different wives at two separate previews at the end of it honey I don't think this show is ever gonna open <laughs> so, <laughs> and, do you and, panic at this point no do you look at Peter and say well we're lost or of course do you just, not no. no no because because you believe in your vision and and it's always the case it's always the case that that whatever you put on the page you hope it will work on the stage, but generally speaking, once you get it in front of audiences, you learn what works. You get, there are great surprises of things that you didn't think were going to work that do, mm. and great opportunities. The truth is, and, and, and the greatest moment of despair, which was the second act of Titanic, and Peter had written a brilliant 40-page uh, version of, of A Night to Remember without a single note of music in it, 
<laughs> and we just could not get it to work. And I was very despondent, and, uh, and basically I looked at him, and he looked at me, and I said, you know what? If, if we were going to call two guys in to fix this show, who would we call? And he said, us! <laughs> <laughs> and I said, so? So, so you got to step back and pretend you're the new guys coming in. Right, and work with pieces of what you have. And, that's when I, and it was that moment when the, men, when the women go into the lifeboats and the men don't, and, and it was an unspeakable moment. I mean, I went home and I thought, gee, this is a... This is literally Dr. Mengele. That's not, you can't put that in a musical. If you go left, you live. If you go right, you die. And then I remembered this Bible show that I had written. <laughs> and I remember <laughs> that One, two, the, three, the, four, the, our, they were, were going to have to leave the so-called Israel and go to Egypt. Mm. And the little kid doesn't want to go. And I had the father sit down and say, oh, come on, you know, what if we just take your little tree here and take it out and put it in the ground? in Egypt, and then I wrote a number called, We're Gonna Plant the Family Tree Down in Egypt. And I thought, oh, if you have a terrible thing, that unspeakable thing, then you can put it on a stage and explain it as you would explain it to a child. If a child says, who was, who was Al Capone or who was Hitler? You say to a child, he was a bad man. And I thought, well, why don't I just have Mrs. Thayer strap, we had a little boy, strap him in a, li in a life belt and sing, you and I are going in a lifeboat. Father will be staying here behind. and." That became the moment. It'll be like rowing in the serpentine. Mm. And that became people getting on. And, and from that moment, in one night, I, I wrote the whole We'll Meet Tomorrow sequence. And I played it for the producer who lived across the street from me, Michael David, at 7 o'clock the next morning. We had a meeting, and I played it for everybody. And Peter said, I think we need to try this. And Richard Jones, the director, said, when can you have it? And I said, well, I, I, if I stay up all night tonight, I can write it. And he said, fine, you write it tonight, and Kevin Stites will teach it to the cast tomorrow at 10 o'clock, and I'll block it at noon. R Richard blocked it by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It went into the show that night, accompanied by a piano, stopped the show. Wow. That's right. It wasn't even orchestrated. No, just no. The and then it was orchestrated the next night, and, and from that moment on, we were a hit. And, and it was just all of us working together. Can you play us some of that, that song? Uh, well, we'll meet tomorrow. We will find the path. And reach tomorrow, past this day of rest. I mean, it was just, you know, Man. it was a gorgeous moment. And, uh, but it was a very operatic moment. And it was everything. Well, the whole score is operatic. Well, every, it was everything that I had learned, which is I really believe, I really believe that musicals have to be radio plays. They have to work completely just to be listened to. And, and when Tommy Toon said, I'm doing nine with just a white tile set, it's because he said all of the scenery is in the score. Mm -hmm. I mean, even we had, we had a number of uh, unusual way. You know, the, the, the opening of the second act starts this way. Why did you bring me to this beach, Guido? Okay, now we don't have to pay for a beach. Yeah. <laughs> right? right? And I just, I made the water. Chords. And it was a while trying to get the actors to, not to wait for the next chord <laughs> before they talked. And then, <laughs> a man like you, and she calls him Casanova, and he says, me, Casanova, and she sings. Sing that song. I In love a it. very unusual way, one time I needed you. In a very unusual way, you were my friend. Maybe it lasted a day. Maybe it lasted an hour. But somehow it will never. make these discoveries this way. That uh, yeah. sense of the water, though, is interesting because in Titanic, there's a song that I, I love, No Moon. No Moon. Which, when I hear that, I thought, this sounds like the sea at night. Yeah, I, you know, I think, that, I think the most exciting thing about being able to write these things is to be a complete composer, which is to let, it, you're not simply writing melody and harmony, you're writing all of the music. And, you know, and if you, you need a crystalline, pristine moment when you have a, uh, uh, Mr. Fleet up in his up in, up in his uh, crow's nest in the middle of the night, and by the way, there w there were no binoculars; they had left them behind. Somebody right. forgot to put them. Oh. In. No moon, no wind, nothing to spy things by. No. Wave, no swell, no line where sea meets sky. Stillness, darkness, 
Can't see a thing, says I, no reflection, not a shadow, not a glimpse of light meets the eye. And we go sailing, sailing, ever westward on the sea. We go sailing, sailing, ever on go we. can paint you that picture, you, you could save a lot of money in scenery. Uh, <laughs> but so I, I think that's the joy of it. I, you know, it's the influence of the, the greats. Schubert teaches us how to do that, and, and, and Cole Porter teaches us how to do that. And I, it, It's yeah. just starting Titanic. Was, it was so difficult, and, and yet I knew in my heart that if I could make you see a thousand people just sitting at the piano, then it, and if it worked with nothing, then it, it was going to work with everything. But the first question is, what is the, what's the tone of it? Yeah. Yeah, you know, is it a happy story or a sad story? So I thought, well, I, I can't really be happy with a major chord. I can't really be, if I do this, it's sad. So I thought, okay, well, what if I just play a major chord in my right hand and a minor chord in my left hand? And then I'll switch them. I'll play a minor chord in my right hand and a major chord in my left hand. And that became... So the, the overture sets it all up by saying, once there was a ship that sank, <laughs> but not yet. And uh, that then becomes the second discovery with Titanic was, what's really the first thing I hear that's going to that's gonna tell that's going to tell the audience that they don't really know the story? And that was when we meet the Stoker kissing his girlfriend goodbye, and he sings, "Fare thee well, my darling. I'll be back before a fortnight has passed." Oh my God, they don't know. We in the audience know, but they don't know. And another guy kisses his girlfriend goodbye. Fare thee well, my darling. I'll be back before a third guy. Fare thee well, my darling. I'll be back before a fourth guy. Fare thee well, my darling. I'll be back before a fortnight has passed. And they meet. Barrett, Stoker off the Maldi. Fleet, look out off the Majestic. Harold Bride, radio operator. They turn and they see the ship. There she is. Ship of dreams Sailing day Morning bright Take your flight Ship of dreams She sails And off we go. Yeah. So, and, and suddenly you, 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 you see this hustle and this bustle and you, you feel it and 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 we just keep adding things to it. Uh, and that's, that's how I knew that we were going to take off. And, and again, how we could stay ahead of the audience. And the great Peter Stone, who had written a show called 1776 yeah. that convinced you that they would never sign, the declaration sign that declaration, yeah. helped us together convince you not that the Titanic wouldn't sink, but that the people on board never believed for a second. How could it? Yeah. And so they were constantly in denial. And that's why, first, they didn't even want to get on the boat, which is historically true, the lifeboats. And then finally, as I say, when the, when the husbands finally see the wives go, that's why they do sing, we'll meet tomorrow. They, they hold out hope I in spite of everything. I absolutely love Titanic, but I, th there hasn't been a uh, Broadway show from you, though, in well, quite a well, while. Peter and I immediately start, got to work on what we wanted to do, a, sh a chamber musical, having done one with, you know, the Titanic with 2,000 right. people called Death Takes a Holiday. Unfortunately, Peter passed away in 2003, but not before he, we had written a draft, and I'm so fortunate that the great Tom Meehan has taken over oh, and sits wonderful. now in Peter's chair, and we're very, very hopeful that we can bring that show in, hopefully the end of this year or the beginning of next year. Well, we got to end. really be great. we got to end this time with you, well, Mark, but would great. you play us? Uh, how about sail on for Susan?
<laughs> the great, great Maury Estes. Look for Death Takes the Holiday is one of my great, great people in the theater, I think. Thanks Thank so much so. for spending time. Our thanks to the Friends of Theater Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>